¿Por qué un modelo distinto para la codificación del derecho internacional del mar? Resulta del todo lógico que de la codificación del derecho internacional del mar a nivel universal se encargue la Organización de the Naciones Unidas. The UN should be in charge of the codification of the international law at a universal level. According to Article 13.1a of the Charter, its plenary body should promote studies and make recommendations in order to foster the progressive development and the codification of the international law. In order to fulfill this mandate, the Assembly created through its Resolution 74.2 from the 27th of November of 1947, the Commission of International Law and passed its statute. That is how the general framework of the codification of the international law was established. This framework, in short, works this way. The Commission chooses the topics that they deem proper to be coded. They designate or they appoint a special rapporteur or a speaker and taking into account their work and after discussing they approve for project draft articles that are sent to the General Assembly. So the Assembly can do one of these three things. First, they might call a conference of plenipotentiaries or to refer the project to the Sixth Commission or the Legal Commission in order to adopt a convention, or they can take note of the project and they can inform the state. We know that within the framework of the United Nations, many important coding conventions have been adopted. And in order to draw them, the scrap procedure was used. And um, they used as a basis the project of the International Law Commission, or ILC. I don't think it's necessary to talk about these conventions because everyone knows about them. However, the very important convention of 1982 about law of the sea that was also concluded within the World Organization was prepared and drawn up by other procedures. That's why mm, this uh, preparation did not use the ILC, this is an institution formed by independent experts, and they resorted to an intergovernmental body. What I'm going to explain in this talk are the three following things. First of all, the reasons that were behind this different type of preparation. Secondly, what were the distinctive features of this preparation, and thirdly, how the intergovernmental conference adopted by the convention happened. We got to the first point, the reasons for its preparation. I should remind you that in 1958, four conventions about the law of the sea had been adopted, prepared by the classical method of the International Law Commission. But in combination with uh, the fast pace for times and a number of different factors, economic, strategical, and uh, strategic and technological, one of them interrelated with a political backdrop, uh, turned this convention into something outdated. The convention of 1958, even though they had come into force and they were binding for some states like Spain. Several economic factors, and uh, especially the claim of the repairing states, especially those that were had recently become independent, they claimed for sovereign rights for the exploration and exploitation of the sea resources, alive and not alive, in maritime spaces that were close to the coast, but with uh, size that was much much bigger than that of the territorial waters in the second phase, economic and technological factors at the same time, after the discovery and the possibility of using up the abyssal, the resources found in the abyssal uh, seabeds, ocean beds, like the so-called nodules of manganese, and thirdly, f strategic factors uh, of the Cold War, such as the claim of the superpowers and their allies, the fact of war, so the aim to replace the traditional regime of innocent passage um, by the passage in transit regime, thanks to which nuclear submarines could navigate 
enter the, the overflights of military aircraft. Characteristics of the preparatory works and its insufficiency. At the beginning of the 70s, in the General Assembly of the Nations, the states became aware of the extreme importance that in the light of these factors, the uses of the sea and the oceans were gaining. And uh, it was necessary to hold a new coding conference. Therefore, they decided to be in charge of this preparation. This preparation was uh, for intergovernmental. And it was entrusted to a commission that uh, was called the Seabed Extended Commission. Resolution 2750 from the 17th of December 1970 of the Assembly called a conference, a meeting of uh, universal makeup, and trusting the Commission the drawing up of one or several convention projects that should serve as basis and to facilitate the works of the conference. That uh, was supposed to happen very fast. The Preparatory Commission met in six sessions from 1971 to 1973. And in this first session, they passed the method of consensus for the adoption of decisions. This method, however, could be replaced at any time by a voting. The developed states, or rather, the interests of the two main lobbies that were present in the conference, the group of interests of uh, the developed states and the group of interests of developing states, or the group of the 77, clearly converged into the method of consensus. The former, the developed states, were aware of their minority position in the negotiations, and they knew that the voting would give favorable results to the third world states. And the latter states did not ignore that the developed states would oppose the holding of a conference in which they could fill in a minority position and in which conventions contrary to their interests could be adopted. All the groups of states were aiming at a legal system that would emerge from a general consent and with and universal focus. This result could only be achieved by means of negotiations and commitments leading to consensus. But the feasibility of the commitments in the preparatory stage was hindered by the lack of political willingness of the states for premature transactions. The states were not willing to sacrifice their positions too early, the sacrifice was left for the final sessions of the conference, and in the most sensitive cases for the last days. As a result of that, the preparatory commission was unable to fulfill its mandate, that is to say, to draw up one or several draft conventions that could serve as a basis for the conference works. Actually, the commission just prepared a listing of topics that was painstakingly negotiated and to record the main proposals from the states. It's true that in specific topics, they could make draft articles, even though alternatively in the most controversial issues which were many and very important. And now I will discuss the development of the conference. The conference began by the end of 1973 and ended with the adoption of the convention on the 30th of April of 1982. And after 11 sessions, some of them were double, and intercession meetings of an informal nature. This long uh, duration is explained by the difficulties that emerged all along the conference. These difficulties were inherent to the model of negotiation that prevailed in the preparatory commission and the conference itself. These difficulties can be broken down into three different categories. First of all, deficit of the preparatory works, later solved by the so-called negotiation texts. Secondly, method of consensus in pursuit of a package deal. and. Thirdly, the emergence and the action of several lobbies that did not have a homogeneous alignment. 
they were made up of heterogeneous ascriptions. With regard to the first difficulty, I must say that even though there was some insufficiency in the preparatory works, the absence of a baseline document, and this was due to political reasons, this difficulty was overcome by an original file of a technical nature, the so-called negotiation texts. These were documents that were drafted as a convention, and, um, and they were written under the responsibility of the president of each commission, and later on under the authority of the president of the conference of the presidents of the main commissions, the rapporteur and the secretariat staff. This, the goal of this text was uh, to support the negotiation, and they accounted for the consensus of the delegations. And the criterion that should guide the writers should be that of presenting solutions to offer the highest perspectives of general consent. Once these negotiations ended, it was quite clear this, that this text would be quite useful. And throughout the conference, they gained more weight and authority till they became the adopted convention. I'm referring to the second difficulty right now. That is to say, the consensus as the main method of adoption in the convention, as laid out in the conference regulation, according to a, an agreement uh, between gentlemen, uh, in the preparatory commission, one could resort to voting if the possibilities to reach consensus had been exhausted. This idea was connected with the idea of the package deal, and uh, it stemmed from the premise that all the problems in the oceanic space are intertwined and they must be treated as a whole. However, and now I will discuss the third difficulty. As it's quite well known, consensus requires negotiations, and in the third conference, they were extremely long, arduous, and complex. The aim was to accommodate important and abundant interests, economic, strategic, all of them with political backdrop of the many states that make up the international community. And in order to defend their interests, the participating states were looking for the support of those who had the same interests. This gave way to the emergence of different groups and counter groups of interests. These groups, uh, it's important to say, this had uh, heterogeneous ascriptions or alignments. This is a factor that complicated consensus even more, the global consensus demanded by the idea of the package deal. And I'll give you some illustrations about this point. First of all, the exploitation of the resources of the ocean seabeds beyond national jurisdiction. In this problem, the opposing groups were the, that of the industrialized states on the one hand and the developing states, or the group of the 77. But this alignment was not repeated in other topics. That is to say, the important issue of the exploitation of the alive and non-alive resources in the EEZ get what to the emergence of uh, two opposing lobbies, that of the landlocked states with a disadvantageous geographical location and that of the riparian states. However, once again, I must say that the alignment was not the same as that of the group of the abyssal seabeds. The developing states were part of the interests of the riparian states, and the developed states were part with them of the same group. Another significant example would be that of the delimitation of the so-called economic zone and the continental shelf. This is a matter that gave way to two opposing lobbies, that of those states that were favorable for the midline and those that were for the resource to the equitable principles. This, in these groups, the ascriptions did not coincide with those existing with regard to the other two 
topics that were mentioned before. That for this was a difficulty that was added to the negotiations that were necessary in order to attain a global and final consensus. As we might know, on the 30th of April 1982, the convention was adopted and not by means of the main method in the regulation of the conference consensus, but by means of the subsidiary method voting, the result of the scrutiny 130 votes for, for against, and 17 abstentions, shows that there were indicative reasons of the impossibility to reach a global and final consensus. The attitude of the United States of America was significant in this regard. Its delegation was opposed to the system of uh, that laid out in the 11th part about the use of resources of the international zone of the marine seabeds. This was a convention that was adopted through voting, even though it was drawn up through consensus, under the spirit of consensus, at least in very important parts of the text. This circumstance explains that to date, autumn of 2012, the number of the states that are participating in this instrument is 164. This is an important figure if we take into account that in the United States there are 193 members. Important states are missing, such as the United States of America, a superpower that has a great naval power, even though they observe important parts of the convention, such as the exclusive economic zone. And um, at times, through the long negotiations, a general case, a general case was adopted. The notion of the EEZ this is a very important particularity of the conference. Therefore, I can say to sum up uh, with uh, the some time perspective that the new the innovative model of negotiation used in the third conference of the United Nations about the law of the sea bore the expected fruit. That is to say, this model met the needs of the international community in connection with the system of the, all the new uses of the sea and the oceans. Thank you for your attention. ...of international law and passed its Astute. That is how the general framework of the codification of the international law was established. This framework, in short, works this way. The Commission chooses the topics that they deem proper to be coded. They designate or they appoint a special rapporteur or a speaker and taking into account their work and after discussing they approve for project draft articles that are sent to the General Assembly. So the Assembly can do one of these three things. First, they made the very important convention of 1982 about law of the sea that was also concluded within the World Organization was prepared and drawn up by other procedures. That's why mm, this uh, preparation did not use the ILC, this is an institution formed by independent experts, and they resorted to an intergovernmental body. What I'm going to explain in this talk are the three following things. First of all, the reasons that were behind this different type of preparation. Secondly, what were the distinctive features of this preparation, and thirdly, how the intergovernmental conference adopted by the convention happened. We got to the first point, the reasons for its preparation. I should remind you that in 1958, four conventions about the law of the sea had been adopted, prepared by the classical method of the International Law Commission. But in combination with uh, the fast pace for times and a number of different factors, economic, strategical, and uh, strategic and technological, one of them interrelated with the political backdrop, uh, turned this convention into some might call a conference of plenipotentiaries 
uh, or to refer the project to the Sixth Commission or the Legal Commission in order to adopt a convention, or they can take note of the project and they can inform the state. We know that within the framework of the United Nations, many important coding conventions have been adopted. And in order to draw them, the scrap procedure was used, and um, they used as a basis the project of the International Law Commission, or ILC. I don't think it's necessary to talk about these conventions because everyone knows about them. However, ¿Por qué un modelo distinto para la codificación del derecho internacional del mar? Resulta del todo lógico que de la codificación del derecho internacional del mar a nivel universal se encargue la Organización de Naciones Unidas. You and should be in charge of the codification of the international law at a universal level. According to Article 13.1a of the Charter, its plenary body should promote studies and make recommendations in order to foster the progressive development and the codification of the international law. In order to fulfill this mandate, the Assembly created through its Resolution 74.2 from the 27th of November of 1947, the Commission 